Talking Illinois High School Football. If your goals are as high as you talk about, tonight's the night you go out and just take one more step. It's a view from the West. And it starts right now! Welcome into View from the West podcast, the podcast that covers Illinois high school football in the Western Big Six, the Three Rivers, the Lincoln Trail, and the Northwest Upstate Illini Conference. This is our first episode of the 2022 season. It's here. Football is back. I'm your host, Greg Armstrong. I have two esteemed colleagues joining me tonight. First, my co-host, the most uniform savvy quarterback in the history of Morrison Mustang football. Mitch Stormer. Mitch, thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, excited to be back. It, it feels like uh, it somehow it feels like it's been a while, but also it hasn't because, you know, the three of us were fortunate to really be covering last season for so long with Lena Winslow. So it really hasn't been that long. But uh, uh, I think when we were talking about earlier today, you know, this is the this is the exciting time. We're not quite into fall ball just yet, but we're getting there and uh, excited to get going. I think like coaches and players, you know, we're interested. We're all itching to get back into it. I'm also, we also have, we're bringing in the NUIC football guru, the Dakota Indian linebacker who still strikes fear in the hearts of ball carriers around Northwest (laughs) Illinois, Kyle Campmeyer. Kyle, how you doing? I'm good, Er, Greg. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm good. (laughs) So, Kyle, I was trying to think, would you be more like a Dick Butkus or a Brian Urlacher? Where where do you put your skill set? Oh, gosh, I'd probably be more like Butkus than Urlacher. Urlacher is <laughs> than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, the real question becomes, if quarterback Mitch Stormer is rolling out of the pocket, scrambling for a first down, going down the sideline, and Kyle's on pursuit, who wins that matchup? Is Mitch getting the first down? No, it's me. All no, day. no. <laughs> Mitch not already says. All. Mitch already says no. He's not getting the first down. No, I'll I'll, I'll pretend to pull a hammer or something to go down before that chase even happens. <laughs> all right, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Well, guys, you you should both feel honored to be here because this afternoon I was texting back and forth with Matt Randazzo from WQAD TV, and he felt a little slighted that he wasn't on the invite list for this first podcast, but I assume. Now, he was on our Instant Reacts podcast every Friday night last year in the fall. We hope to get those back up and going once the season starts. I figured he was too busy covering JDC golf and Legion baseball. So we'll, we'll say when he gets into football mode, we'll, we'll bring him in. So you guys are on tonight. Before we get into this football season, I think we have to talk about the 1 through 32, the seeding that was and now that wasn't voted on by the IHSA. So back in February, the board of directors of the IHSA voted to go one through 32 seating for classes one through 6A, which historically had been divided into 16, 7A through an 8A, had always done one through 32. The board later reversed that decision. It was a combination of hearing feedback from athletic directors around the state and also current gas prices. Kyle, I'll start with you. Take me through kind of the roller coaster of emotion that was hearing one through 32 and then having it taken away. Well, obviously, we've been wanting one through 32 for quite a while, especially when you take a look in class 1A and the NUIC's dominance as far as state championships over the past 12 seasons. Um, and, and some of the teams that we felt could be state title contenders and were knocked out in the second round quarterfinals or even those epic semifinal battles between Forrest and Alina Winslow. Um, And when you saw the news in a couple or last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was that it was no longer going to be, it's like, Oh, yay. We got to go back to one through 16. (laughs) And and it's, it was, it was really deflating because it's like, okay, now we're going to see, state title contenders knocked out in the second round quarterfinals or a semifinal again. And, um, you know, outside of the NUIC contingent that we see being uh, the perennial powers to be of class 1A. And then, you know, you throw Dupec in there as well, who you'd be interested to see how they really do in uh, 3A when you get them away from like the Immaculate Conception roller coaster 
or the Byron power train that, that, that they keep running into just to see how they would really match up with the rest of the field. And now you don't get to see it because you know exactly what you're going to get when the playoff pairings come out. You're going to see that NUIC contingent all right here, and you're going to have Dupac right there in the middle with IC Catholic and Byron again. Yeah, I mean, taking it kind of out of the NUIC, but, you know, from the outside of the NUIC looking in, I always, you know, go back to my alma mater, Ottawa Marquette. I mean, year in and year out, they're, you know, been putting up great records and they know that they're going to get challenged in the playoffs. But it seems like, you know, when you go one through 16, they're inevitably the one year they ran into, I think, three NUIC teams in a row, first round, second round, third round. And I mean, for a team like that, if you break that up, one of those brackets, if you break it up a little bit, there's a chance they're in the semifinals or, you know what I mean? There's a chance their bracket shakes out a little differently. Uh, you know, you win the games that are in front of you, but it does seem like with such a top loaded bracket on paper, you know, we see it year in and year out. It seems like it's top loaded. It's just, man, you wish that you could see what it would look like going one through 32. Mitch, we talked about it. We did a whole podcast on one through 32 and how excited we were. And then we texted back and forth. I think you were the first one to see it and texted me like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, oh no. Uh, yeah. what, what was your thought? Take me through it. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Kyle really wrapped it up pretty well. It was just that sense of kind of disappointment from being on such a high of, of hearing that they were going to make that kind of universal across all the all the classes, um, and then just kind of swiftly and quietly it kind of went back the other way. So um, I'm I'm interested to hear your interview um, because I would like to hear the reasoning or what there is for the future. Um, you know, I, I understand if, if maybe you know, gas prices and, and logistics and things like that are the main reason at the moment until they figure it out. That all makes sense, but it doesn't take away that disappointment. So, uh, you, you know, the, like Kyle said, the North has dominated, the North schools have dominated, not just in the NUIC, but just across really 1A, 2A, probably 3A as well, um, before you get into those larger schools. The North has, has been the champions more times than not. And so you wonder how many of those finals, how many of those semifinals of you know two conference teams playing each other how many of those games are we missing by not having a one through 32 because I think we'll see that um in in the lower in the in the 1a and the 2a more so you know hopefully it's still on their on their agenda for the future um while they figure it out and uh you know I'm happy to wait for it as long as they're uh they're willing to, to provide it and figure out a plan so hopefully hopefully that excitement comes back and uh we'll uh we'll crawl out of this depression <laughs> there you go yeah well, Mitch, you referenced the interview. I encourage everyone to come back next week. Next week's episode I'm really excited about. I interview IHSA board president and Rockridge principal Katie Hassan. She really breaks down the 1 through 32 seating decision. She also talks about the future uh, home of the state championships and where they may end up. And then also talks about what eight-man football looks like moving forward. She has a lot of great insights so please, everyone listening, come back next week if you're interested in this topic, which I'm sure most of our listeners, if you're interested in high school football, you're going to want to hear all this. It's, it's a really good interview. So, um, well, guys, let's, let's move into, you know, this season, 2022. Game schedules were just announced on Friday. But I think before we get into the games, I think we need to talk about some of the news and notes moving into this season, some changes we got happening. I'm going to start with uh, Ridgewood which is the Cambridge Alwood co-op is going from 11 man to eight man. Now they struggled last year to find victories, but they were a playoff team in 11 man football, I believe in 2019. So not all that long removed from playoff success. They are now going to eight man. And what really intrigues me about them moving to eight man is the new head coach, Pat Elder. He's the son of hall of fame coach, John Elder who is a legendary Alexis Cardinals head coach for almost 30 years. He has an impressive resume. Pat Elder has compiled 133 and 78 record over 20 seasons. He led Sherrard from 99 to 05, including 10 and one seasons in 01 and 05. And then he also was at Richmond Burton from six, from 06 to 16. Here, he really had great success. The Rockets made the playoffs 10 times. They went to the semifinals in 09 the quarterfinals again in 2010 and they finished as a uh, class 4a runners up in 2011 so this you know that is a great coaching resume 
coming to Ridgewood in the eight-man game. Kyle, you've seen it firsthand up in the NUIC. The eight-man division has gotten really competitive. But how fun is it to see a big splash like this with Ridgewood, you know, to see if maybe they can make some noise in eight-man? Well, I mean, we, since eight-man got a lot larger after the uh, 2019 season, with, or, well, really after the COVID season, all these teams going into it to expand it up to 24 teams. And I think it's up to what, 28 teams as we head into 2022 here. Um, you're, you've seen where these playoff caliber teams that are coming out of 11, man, have really shown what they can do in the eight man game that have made the games more competitive. And I mean, here again, talking about the NUIC, we saw it with the Orangevilles, uh, the, the Aquins, the Milledgevilles, um, as soon as they added that depth of competition to eight man football, all four of them or all three of them were ranked right up there in the top four with defending state champion Polo um, at one point or another. And it made it a lot of fun. So seeing another team like Ridgewood come in that has that playoff experience. And I mean, it's not so long ago, you know, well, it probably is getting closer to 20 years already, but it doesn't feel so long ago. You know, Cambridge was a state championship caliber squad in the early 2000s. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one of the best teams in the Lincoln trail for a while, you know, before they ended up co-oping and, you know, they were, you know, playing really good football. So I agree. That's, that's one that really intrigues me. Mitch, what do you got for some news and notes here? Yeah, uh, I'm going to switch gears to the Three Rivers, uh, Mississippi, um, and, and certainly one of the most successful programs that we talk about, and certainly in, in the history of the IHSA and Sterling Newman, they've got a new coach. Uh, Brandon Kressmer left. He got a job at his alma mater at Western Illinois coaching the linebackers uh, after a great uh, three years, I think, three or four years there uh, at yep. Newman, including a state championship. So. Um, you know, we wish the, the best for him, but they bring in Mike LeMay. It's, it's a familiar name to Newman. He is an alum there. Um, he has spent the last 10 years at Sterling. So just down the road um, as a defensive coordinator. And, and we've spoken plenty about Sterling's success uh, recently, uh, certainly since we've been doing this podcast and certainly on the defensive side of the ball. So um, it's an exciting hire. I know Mike, we went to, we competed against each other. He was at Newman when I was at Morrison. We went to St. Ambrose together. Um, so it, it's cool to, to see someone familiar, get that, that sort of role. Um, we'll have to look back, Greg, cause I don't, I don't know if I said it on the show or if I texted it to you, but I thought that he would be on the short list. Um, and, and then they announced it a couple months after that. So cool. It's cool to see him there, um, and see what they can do. They were injury plagued last season, um, and still made it to the playoffs and still made, got a, a round one win. So. Um, excited for, for Mike, excited for the comments to see uh, how they do and see if they can get back to the top of the conference because I know that that's their goal uh, year in and year out. Yeah, the, um, LeMay's name was a, was a name that I had heard as a coordinator because John Schlemmer spoke so highly of him with the success that Sterling had had. When I, when I would ask John about what they were doing and what was going so well for them, Schlemmer was always quick to point out how well his defense was run because of you know, the way that LeMay ran it. So I agree. That's a great hire. Yeah. And not only that, but I'm pretty sure he was their, their strength coach. And so if he was leading the Sterling weight room, uh, you know, and he's probably going to do the same at Newman and that's what they're known for. That's always what they're known for. So again, this is, this is a, a knockout hire and uh, excited to see them uh, piece on the grass here in a couple months. Yep. Well, Kyle, plenty of storylines in the NUIC every year. Sure. This year does not disappoint. Let's go through the go through the list. Give me give me what you got. Well, you know we saw Brock Kunder, the head coach at Aquin, uh, step down to take a, a different position somewhere else. And with that, you know Aquin has backed it up with the hire of Bill Shepard, who has been a head coach and an assistant coach at uh, a plethora of teams throughout the area. Um, Back in 1990 through 92, he was the head coach at Oregon, where he put up a 6-21 and record there. Later became a head coach at Christian Life from 2016 to 2019, where he was 10-25. and So his career uh, head coaching record is 16-46, and but he's also had assistant stops at Durant, Pecatonica, and South Beloit throughout the years as well. 
Um, it's one of those hiring decisions that I think is kind of um, a little puzzling to a degree because, you know, Aquins had uh, former EPC coach Randy Ashey as part of the junior high program for so many years, uh, along with some uh, Aquin alums who a lot of people in the Aquin area in that contingent felt would be the front runners for the position. And then the administration goes and hires coach Shepard. So we'll kind of see how that plays out. I think there's going to be some people moving or uh, the possibility of that happening, the, according to the rumor mill up here, you know, um, people are moving out of the Aquin area either going to Freeport. I've heard a couple that are headed to Byron. So we'll see how it all plays out there. Hopefully for Coach Shepard's sake, you know, he can keep everything going afloat because Aquin has put together a very good resume over the last six, seven years as well. Uh, Orangeville has brought back Jay Doyle as their head coach. Uh, Bill Meyer stepped down after one year and getting that state runner up for the Broncos in the eight-man game. Uh, he stepped away. They had hired uh, their assistant, Mitchell Dean. And within a month, he had stepped down to take a position at Rockford Auburn uh, as an offensive line coach there. So that opened up the opportunity for Jay Doyle to step back in to regain the reins. And his last three years at Orangeville, he led them to the Class 1A state playoffs, even including an upset win over uh, Chicago Hope in the first round back in 2019. 19. Um, 11 man, you got West Carroll returning to 11 man play this year. Uh, so we'll finally get to see head coach tail Clark take the reins. He came into West Carroll, uh, and immediately they decided that they weren't going to have 11 man football coming out of the COVID season. Uh, so we really haven't seen a whole lot of, uh, games from him because they had cut their season short during the COVID season. Um, and then, of course, we have East Dubuque, who has left the conference to go into a co-op with Southwestern and Hazel Green, Wisconsin. So they're going to move into the Six Rivers Conference uh, up there. And uh, they did hire Edler as the head coach. So he was the head coach at East Dubuque. He will stay on as the head coach of the new co-op as well. Mitch, the... Uh... You know, the six rivers, they're, they're uh, doubling up on your three rivers action here on the Illinois side. I tell you. Yeah. Lots of water up there. <laughs> lots of, lots of banks, lots of, lots of coastline. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we're looking ahead at uh, storylines in 2022, Mitch, what stands out to you? What, what are you kind of, what intrigues you going into this football season? Yeah, I'll, I'll let, I'm going to defer everything in UIC to Kyle, but I was thinking about this the other day that we're kind of in the same predicament as we were last year in that conference, right? But before the season started, we were thinking, okay, is this year that someone is going to dethrone Leah Winslow? And we kind of got half of an answer, right? You, you had uh, Dupec win the conference, but Leah Winslow still wins the 1A title. So I guess now you have two questions. Um, can anyone top them again in the conference and can anyone in 1A beat Lena Winslow so I'm intrigued to see how that plays out obviously they have a lot of a lot of parts that are going to be new um losing quite a few starters on those on those so good on those so good teams but I have I have no doubt that there'll be another force so uh but again I'll defer my or any NUIC things to Kyle but but for me um you know looking at least in the three rivers you look at the teams that one last year, can Erie Prophetstown repeat? That was the first time they had won their the division. Um, you know, can Monmouth Roseville make another run in in that uh, in that rock? Uh, in the Mississippi, you know, Kiwani, what a great year that they had. Uh, kind of, I think I think they were co champs with Princeton, right? Yeah. Um, and Prue St. Bede was right there. So excited to see who comes back. Um, or uh, sorry, I, I should say, who, see who comes out on top with what they have coming back. Cause I think it's going to be another exciting season. Obviously we just talked about Newman having a new head coach. So that's a new, new direction for them. Uh, obviously rock Ridge has some starters coming back. They, they lost four games last year and I think they were all pretty close and they had a great playoff uh, performance too. So, um, you know, really looking forward to three rivers this year. 
Um, the Lincoln Trail too, you know, um, A-Town and, and Knoxville had such impressive seasons last year. Um, and I think, Greg, they – did. Are, are they – Merging with the Prairie Land now is that that'll start in 23. Okay, so we have one more year of the Lincoln Trail. Yeah, but okay. I agree. I think looking at A Town and Knoxville stepping in last year, yeah, they became tops of the conference. So that you know that added an interesting dynamic to that conference for sure. Yeah. So can they? You know, can they do it again? I really liked, um, you know, what Mercer County did last year. So. You know, you had, and, and we can't forget about United. What a great season United had from from years of being kind of in the depths of that conference. So, um, yeah, looking forward to really. You look at all those teams. It can uh, Anna and Weathersfield come back? You know, around. So, um, uh, in, at least in those two conferences, you got quite a few. You know, uh, opportunities for a lot of teams to to come out on top this year, or see if the defending champs can uh, retain their titles. Yeah, I think when you look at the three rivers and, you know, Princeton has been so good for the last few years and they still have Tegan Davis back this year at quarterback. Yeah, that's a storyline that stands out to me. But Kiwani, can they can they maintain that level that they played at last year? Because, man, when when Kiwani and Princeton are are doing battle, I mean, when they're at the top of that conference, that really makes that conference fun because those two rivals that that's just a great rivalry. So I. I think that's exciting. I think from the Lincoln Trail standpoint, you know, Knoxville came in and looked great last year, but they lost some key, they lost some starters. A Town played really well, but they lost a lot on offense and defense. Yep. So I think is there an opportunity for Princeville or Anawan Weathersfield or even a Stark County teams that were younger last year to make a move to get back up to the t- Mercer County too? Certainly, that's a team that I think could end up near the top of the conference, if not at the top of the conference as well. So that, yeah, that's stuff to follow. Kyle, what do you, what's your storylines? You know, you're, you're NUIC focused first. So I I think we'll start there, but let me know. What are you looking at? Well, going back to what you were saying about the Lincoln trail, you know, I think looking at where you're going to see the top, I think you'll see Knoxville there. I think you're going to see Anawan Weathersfield start to come back to the top. And I, I agree with you on Mercer County being one of those top three. I think those three teams are the ones that are going to be the ones to watch there. Mid-level, you're looking at United, Princeville, and A-Town. And then, you know, lower it would be Stark County and Rovo, Williamsfield. It, it's hard to tell what Stark County has. Um, they got a young team. You think that they are going to start picking things up. You know, it's, we're not too far away from them having 23 consecutive playoff appearances, and then all of a sudden, they fell off and, you know, coach Nord's still there. So it's not a program issue per se, but it's just how much talent do they have coming back up here in the NUIC, you know, one of the biggest things that has gotten the uh, world of fire is the movement of Gunnar Lobdell going to Lena Winslow, leaving Orangeville to go to Lena Winslow for a senior year. And, um, you know, it's, as if Lena Winslow needed to have another arsenal to their already highly octane offense. They just got a huge critical piece, both offensively and defensively with Lob Dell moving there. So, so fill me in real quick. I mean, off the top of your head, what he put up huge numbers for Orangeville last year, led him to the, it like, yeah, it was like 2,100 yards or something. 2,396. <laughs> and they Orangeville ended up, like we said earlier, as the state runner up at eight man. And now yep. Lobdell is their leading running back ends up on Lena Winslow. Does he become their top option? I don't, you know, Lena Winslow never really, well, they do and they don't, they like to have a good mixture. So it's yeah. hard to tell who their top options are. Obviously they got Gage Dunker who will be a junior this year coming back. He's definitely going to take over that full back position. And then you got Jake Zeal coming back as well. So you got, power up the middle and then you got speed to whatever side of the wing you want it to be on. And um, it just creates what we always call Lena Winslow, the three headed monster. And they have it once again, and it's like, okay, what are you doing with it? And, and who's going to stop it? So, um, you know, are there teams out there that can stop Lena Winslow? Absolutely. Is it going to be a, requiring you to play at your best level of football? Yes, because if you're not, they're going to eat you up and they're going to chew you out. And 
uh, quite honestly, you know, when the state rankings come out, everybody's going to have Lena Winslow at number one. I don't see who is going to put anybody else above them, and there shouldn't be anybody else above them. I w- I'm going to be disappointed if I see one of the voters not vote for Lena Winslow at number one because that's just a disservice to what they have done and what we have seen over the past 12 seasons. They've won five state titles, and I mean, they've made it past the second round every year, but one, I believe, which was back in 2015. Yeah, Kyle, Gunnar Lobdell being tossed into the middle of that Lena Winslow offense and defense, for that matter, certainly adds another gear and just such another dynamic athlete to an already dynamic roster. What else, Kyle? What else do you see in the NUIC? Uh, well, there's one thing I have not mentioned yet, and that's the you know Dan Sheets taking over the Dakota program, my alma mater. Um Actually, this past week, they had Coach Lano uh, out at their uh, football camp. And so it was great to see that take place, um, trying to see what Coach Sheets can do with the Indians and um, try to get the ship going back afloat to get the program back to the level that the community wants it to be at. But with that comes the commitment level from the players and the coaches alike to make that happen. So it'll be interesting to see how they do that. They have a lot of talent. It's just how can they get that talent and develop it and keep it moving forward. So that'll definitely be uh, uh, something to watch as we uh, move forward in the season. Can they get back to that playoff level? And and the same with Stockton. I mean, Coach Lightson has done a great job with Stockton, and you're starting to see a lot of things – move in the right direction for the Blackhawks. So those two teams right there are teams that I have on my watch list as teams that were in the playoffs last year, but have the potential to earn their way back into it this year. So it'll be interesting to see how those guys shake out. Well, I would say that uh, we're a fan of coach sheets here on the view from the West podcast, because last fall when we, uh, When we introduced him or made the announcement that he had gotten the job at Dakota, he sent me a direct message on Twitter like the next day saying he listened to the podcast and thanked me for, you know, giving him a shout out. So, hey, if he's listening in and and giving a thank you message, we're we're a fan. We'll we'll take it. So uh, and bring it bring in Coach Lano to practices. That's so cool. That was that was great. I saw you retweeted a picture of it. And that's just a cool thing to do. So. It's huge. It's huge for Dakota all the way around. And. I mean, hopefully it pays dividends. Kyle, we've never talked about this before. Uh, The most depressed I've ever seen Mitch Stormer is uh, (laughs) leaving Dakota's football field in 2006, I think. State quarterfinals, Dakota defeated Morrison, and Mitch was there with me as an intern. I was covering it for TV. And let me tell you, Kyle, Mitch was a, a quiet intern on the ride home. Not even a McRib from McDonald's could cheer him up. No. Count. Well, that was, that was, that was two years in a row that Morrison's season had ended at Dakota. Cause I was on the 05 team and that's where our season ended in the second round. So yeah, that was a tough one to swallow. We just, that was a hurdle we couldn't get over. And yeah, those were I, good Morrison teams. Cause I, I think it was the year was I have 2007 to- or 2008 that Morrison went on to win. So just Dakota was the hump that, that stopped us. Yep. It was the 07 season because okay. uh, the 06 season ended for Dakota in the second round to Alito, who they beat in the state championship game the year before in 05. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hear that they beat the Mustangs <laughs> in quarters. It was 09 when the Mustangs won state. They, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know Mitch all that well back then, and it was a it was a quiet ride home. Mitch you didn't learn bad. anything that day. You learned nothing that day. <laughs> that was a hard hitting football game, from what I heard. I was living in Colorado at the time, so I didn't get to see it, but I was definitely following it closely online, and I heard it was a very hard hitting game. Yeah, it was a it was a great game. It was a great playoff atmosphere. That's the only time I've ever made the trip to Dakota, so I, I was glad that I could be there. It was it was fun. I, I was, you know, sad for my intern, Mitch, but uh, yeah. it, it was a great playoff experience. You know, I was, I was just looking at your guys, and we're, we're going to get into games that we're looking forward to. But, um, and Kyle, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but last year the NUIC played all conference games. Is that right? They played all conference all nine were conference games. Nope, they, they did have one non conference. Okay, they had one non last year with uh, West okay. Carroll being out. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because that, that's what I was looking at. So I noticed that they do play. Uh, they play one uh, again crossover game or, or out of conference game this year. So I was just trying to remember that rightly. And on the same line, uh, Lincoln Trail plays two out of conference games this year. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting match. When looking at some of the names, I've never even heard of some of the teams. So interesting matchups uh, and, and new teams, new faces this year. That'll be fun. Yes, we will get into matchups to watch for. My storyline going into 2022, I'm going to talk about the big schools we cover, the Western Big Six. The question is, who wins the Western Big Six? I think we, I think we ask every year because we feel like every year it's a competitive conference. And maybe I sound like a broken record, but I do really believe this year it's pretty wide open. I mean, obviously, Sterling was so banged up last year. They were so hurt. And they lost so many key players along the way. They have running back Antonio Tablante back this year. Quarterback Kale Ryan is back this year, healthy again. So they are certainly in the mix. Moline loses some significant pieces, but they return Riley Fuller and Grant Sibley, who both did good work for him last year. Rocky returns Quintarian Brooks. Brooks put up 300 yards and six touchdowns in one game against Springfield. <laughs> you know, it was it was a season-ending loss, but he still put up some huge numbers. He's back for Rock Island. But I think what really intrigues me, and Mitch, we talked a lot about it last year, is that Quincy was pretty young last year. United mm-hmm. Township was pretty young. And Geneseo was pretty young. Yep. And that doesn't include, I know Galesburg lost some pieces. I don't know all that they have coming back. So I do think there's a lot there that you know that could really be interesting you know who's ends up in the top tier of this conference who makes a move I guess is my question well Greg if you remember correctly one of us correctly predicted this last year um, <laughs> yeah. one of I us did Mitch I don't know if I'm ready to do that just yet because I'm sure we'll do specific kind of conference preview shows so I think I need a little more time before uh, I make a, a prediction here yep um but yeah, I think you're right in that if there was a year where it's a little bit more wide open, yeah, this this is it. So, like you said with the younger teams, you know, Matthew Kelly at UT, um, yep. you know, can can that offense, you know, replicate what they were doing um, this year and, and in the COVID shortened season? Um, Genesee the same and Ed Quincy, like you said. So, uh, with, with Rocky having to replace quarterback, Moline having to replace the quarterback, um, you know, what are those offenses going to look like? Are they going to be uh, as powerful? I don't I don't know what Moline has personnel wise, but I know they have a lot of running coming back. So maybe they won't be uh, as uh, as air rate as they were without Ponder and Matthew Bailey. Um, those are two really hard pieces to replace. But um, I, I, all the faith in Coach Morrissey that they're going to have a plan uh, and Sterling, too. Like you said, they were so injury injury bitten last year. I think they had it was something like five or six two-year starters that were hurt. And some of those guys are back. So, um, and obviously when you have a Antonio Tablante to really anchor that offense, um, it's going to be fun, you know? Um, and, and really just, I was thinking about this earlier too. I just, I want to give a shout out to everyone at Rock Island Alleman. Yep. Cause I know that they have had such a tough time the past couple of years, just in, within the school, within the administration, within the athletic department, it seems like they're getting back, on the right track, you know, that conference is so much better when they're involved and when they're better. Um, If I'm thinking correctly, I think that they're the last Western big six team to go to a state championship game. I think, right. Yeah. You know, shout out to everyone in in the all of system who's working to get back on track because it looks like, you know, getting new athletic directors, getting new coaches, hopefully that leads to new numbers. So, um, you know, they they had a tough time on on the field last year because they they had, like 20 kids. So, you know, hopefully it comes back. They have arguably the best player in the history of the quad cities on their Mm -hmm. roster. So talk about uh, your, yeah. Talk about your new recruit for your Notre Dame fighting Irish, Mitch. Yeah. Lineman, uh, Jagashaw, Charles Jagashaw, um, you know, underrated as a lot of linemen kind of go, you know, but he's an enormous, enormous guy. Um, and, and yeah, just recently committed to Notre Dame. So, um, 
you know, the, the team, the record, I, I don't know what it's going to be like this year. I can only say that it wasn't, you know, they didn't win last year. Um, but they, they've got some pieces. I think they just need to get their numbers up and they'll be right back, uh, you know, starting to compete again. But again, just wanted to give a quick shout out to everyone who's, who's working to get that program back on track. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it when he was hired. I think Fritz Deodone is a, is a great hire. I think he seems like a great guy, a great fit for that program. And he was put in a really tough spot. So, you know, I think you take small victories where you get them. I think Jagasaw signing to go to Notre Dame is great for the program. It's great for kids to see, you know, that type of talent be rewarded. Um, so we'll see what happens, you know, on the field. It's it's an uphill battle because they're a school that has gotten smaller in recent years and they're only playing against big schools, you know, week in and week out. So that that's an uphill battle for sure. But, you know, they're going in fighting week in and week out. So, um, yeah, like you said, I think it's good to give them a shout out and, uh, you know, good luck to them this year. All right, let's talk about the key matchups, the matchups that stand out to us this year. View from West Pod on Twitter. Uh, we put out kind of our matchups that we're looking at this year. So I guess, Kyle, I'll start with you. You talked about the eight-man ranks has a lot of intriguing matchups. NUIC always has the games. It's got to be Lena Winslow and Forreston, and then Lena Winslow and Dupec, and Dupec and Forreston. Those are kind of the you know, the big ones to start, but you know, what games stand out to you? Well, looking at the 11, man, like you said, um, you know, everybody thought that Lena Winslow was the team to beat last year. Obviously they, they proved it, but they did have uh, two losses, one to do Peck and then that week nine thriller to Forreston. Of course, the Panthers got the last laugh two weeks later in the second round of the playoffs with the annihilation of Forreston. But, you know, they there's a very good rivalry uh, with Forreston and Lena Winslow that kind of reminds me of the days of the Lena Winslow and Dakota rivalries back in the mid to late 2000s. Um, and that's, that's where we see Forreston and Lena Winslow at right now. And it's a lot of fun to see because, um, you know, here in – most recent years, Lena Wenzel's had the number on Forreston. And, uh, you know, we, we watched Forreston get that unbelievable upset in the 2018 season on their way to their third state title. And, you know, even to this day, a lot of people feel, myself included, that Lena Winslow should have won that game and didn't. Um, obviously, Forreston earned it the way they should have, but when you take a look and break it down on paper, Lena Winslow was a better team than what they played that day. Um, and uh, last year, even, you know, Forreston was not at the same caliber as Lena Winslow, but they were in week nine. <laughs> you know, they just came out and played an unbelievable game and it worked out in their favor. And they had that last drive that went, what, 94 yards and, and they won it as time was running out. So that was really exciting. So you never know what you get out of those two games. Obviously, Dupac has definitely turned the tide very quickly to be at the forefront of the NUIC. And they are trying to stake their claim to being in that same conversation with Lena Winslow and Forreston. And rightfully so. They've, they've done it the right way in their program as they are – heading into what your year six now the co-op. So, you know, they've in both of the last two playoff seasons, they've been able to do enough to make the playoffs last year, obviously breaking through with that conference championship. So now it's time to see, you know, what's the next step uh, with the Rivermen. And, you know, they got a lot of pieces to replace, especially on that offensive line. The only one that they have coming back are Caden Degner and Breon Green. So they're going to have to find some uh, guys to step up to fill those roles. I think they can definitely do that. But then you got to replace some skill set players as well uh, with uh, Trenton Taylor and Hunter Hoffman leaving too. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see because it sounds like they're going to have a little bit of a quarterback battle. But yeah, Dupec and uh, uh, Lee win in week seven and then Lee win and Forrest in week nine. Um, one of the ones that I really like, am intrigued to see is Dupec and Knoxville in week five. Uh, you know, 
Last time we saw a team go down to Knoxville was Orangeville during the COVID season. Um, thought that was going to be a good game, and Coach Hebbard and his Blue Bolts got the best of the Broncos that time. But uh, um, we'll see how that plays out for Dupac. I think that's a great challenge once again for them to pick up because obviously they only had the one-year game with St. Teresa for that spot so it it is what it is at that moment so they're able to pick up knoxville which is huge um forreston is got their play dates with gcms in week eight on a saturday afternoon um gcms was injury riddled last year but uh if you ask the people around the hoic one of the teams to watch again coming out of that conference are the falcons um, so that will be a pretty good uh, matchup too. And you can't count out Fulton. I mean, Fulton loses a lot of a lot of talents well, from their past season and even the 20, uh, 20 COVID season. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what Fulton does. And then the last game that just blows it away in the NUIC is the potential week six matchup of Lena Winslow and Marion Central Catholic. Um, if you look at the IHSA website, Marion's is scheduled with Chicago Leo and Lena Winslow has an open date. But if you go on Twitter and look at Marion Central Catholic's Twitter page, they have their full schedule out. It has Lena Winslow scheduled. That game is scheduled in Lena. I've talked to Coach Aaron about it just two days ago, and he said Marion Central Catholic would be their competition. And he also uh, said that uh, – Steve Susi is already aware of this game. So um, hard to tell what is all transpiring right there, but uh, it sounds like that's that's a go game. So it'll be interesting to see that one, and that'll be a Friday night in Lena. Man, that's that's an awesome one. You know, I, I love it. Where did, did Lena go up to uh, DePaul last year? Was that the school they played up in Chicago a year yeah. ago? DePaul Prep. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that they're just willing to take those games that are kind of, you know, way off the radar from from most 1A schools and they're and they're and they're taking them, you know, they're going for it. It's it's awesome. And that Knoxville and Dupec game, man, Mitch, it makes me really think we should become like the uh, like the intermediary between the schools that we cover on opposite sides of the area. And just like they can come to us and say, which school should we play? And then we can point them in the right direction, you know? Yeah, we can we can do that. We can help with you know uh, uniforms. We can do it all here at, at View from the West. We are a full service podcast. Mitch is itching to be like the uniform advisory committee for oh, these teams. God. He can't wait. If if coaches would just come to us and ask that, oh man. So I'd yeah, quit my job. I quit my job. I do it full time. <laughs> I'll do it for free. That's but man, I just I do peck in Knoxville. That's that for our area. That's just a perfect crossover of like you know you always think about what if you know, this team and this team from other conferences play each other. It's like Lena Winslow and Princeton going yeah. during the COVID year. It's, it's those, you know, those hypothetical matchups that get to come to, you know, come to fruition. It's great. So Mitch, have you uh, had a chance to dig through the schedules? What games, what games can you uh, not wait to talk about? What are you excited about? You know, the, who's going to come out on top of the NUIC is really going to happen in week seven when you have that Lena Dupec, and then Fulton and Forreston. I think at the end of that night, you're really going to have a more clear picture uh, of who's going to maybe survive the last two weeks. Obviously, Lena and, and Forreston playing week nine. But I think that week seven, those, those two games certainly uh, have some separation. Um, also, before I get to the games that I like in the other in, in two other conferences, just for fun, I looked up a team that we talked about a lot last season, both with our, our teams playing them and just in general. I looked up IC Catholic's schedule this year. They open up with Lombard Montini and Joliet Catholic. <laughs> yeah. So, and then they'll play in three A, three A the playoffs. So you know, just not to not to dig up an old wound, but I, I just wanted to look up uh, who they play, and it's just a it's just nine just bangers of games. Hey, they're and, a great school program. Yeah, no a great small it. school program. So Kyle, by explain to me again. The rule is if the rules stay as they are now by losing to Byron last year, they're in three A for at least another couple of years, correct? Yeah. Yes, because they'll they'll have the multiplier uh, 
already because they have three playoff wins since they made it to the semifinals. Um, this year, they have to be in 3A regardless because they petitioned up and your petition's good for two seasons. Okay. So they'll be in 3A again this year since they already petitioned it last year. And then because they already have the three playoff wins, they're already going to get hit with the multiplier for 2024. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, 2023. They play, they play one game against a team with an enrollment under 400. And it's, and it's Bishop McNamara, <laughs> who <laughs> is in the same predicament in two way. <laughs> oh, oh, goodness. All right. Yeah. Well, back to back to uh, matchups that I like. Um, I looked in the Three Rivers and I looked in the Lincoln Trail. Um, starting in Three Rivers, uh, your, your classic rivalry in week one, Morrison Newman. Uh, also in week one, Kiwani Monmouth Roseville. That was a good game last year. Um, that, that's a game that maybe. See if either team is for real this year. Again, in week one, Princeton Rock Ridge. So you have three really good, uh, you know, starts to the season uh, uh, there in, in Three Rivers. Um, uh, a rematch of a classic last year in week four, Rock Ridge and Prophetstown. I know both teams are going to look a lot different, but still, uh, I think they'll have the personnel to, to kind of have one of those run and shoot type of games like they did last year. And then in week five, Princeton and Kiwani. Always a fun matchup. Always a really, a really, a hard hitting fast game that'll that'll probably you know determine uh that division so those are good ones in the three rivers uh, looking at lincoln trail too week one united and kiwani weathersfield uh again one of those one of those games if you, that might determine the success of their season uh in, in a week one matchup also in week one we talked a lot about mercer county all three of us think they're they're probably going to be a name in that conference they're going to have a test in week one against farmington uh, the, the crossover game that, that typically happens. I think it was, was that canceled last year? No, they played. I think, I think Farmington won pretty handily. I, I think that Mercer County sure? I, was that, a, but there was a Mercer County game that they had to cancel because of COVID. I thought that that was that game. Oh, am I, I, uh, am I remembering that wrong? I'd have to look. Yeah, go ahead. But I'd have to look. Okay. That, but yeah. Anyway, um, keeping with Mercer County in week four, they play a town. Week five, Kyle, you mentioned it, Knoxville and Dupec. That'll be that'll be a lot of fun. Um, and then in week eight, the the game that really determined the conference last year, Knoxville and A Town. That was such a such an exciting game last year. And again, both teams are going to look different, but um, I'm sure Knoxville is looking for a little bit of revenge the way that one ended. So um, yeah, I am really looking forward to looking at the, looking at the schedules on all the conferences that we cover, especially the NUIC. I mean, that's every week there there's a pivotal matchup. So um, but but the same is true in, in every every conference that we cover. Uh, Mitch, the game that you're thinking of, we were denied Knoxville and Mercer County last year in week oh, two, okay. which would have been great. That would have been a great oh, matchup. Yeah. I wish we'd have been yeah. able to see that one. So yeah, it was uh, week two. Um, you know, I'll I'll go back to the Western Big Six, and I, I think obviously the one that stood out to me right away was in week eight. It's Sterling at Moline. So there you mm-hmm. go. I mean, we've talked about those have been the top two teams in the conference. They're playing in week eight. But getting back to these kind of the teams that intrigue me on who can make a move. And I think you start looking at Geneseo at United Township in week three. Also Quincy at Moline in week three. So, you know, who wins those games early in the season, week three, early in the conference season? Who wins? Who gets that, you know, that leg up right away in the conference? You look down the road, I think in week eight, Galesburg at United Township becomes a very pivotal game again this year. And then obviously you can't go wrong with Moline and Rock Island in week four. Mm-hmm. Last year, I think Rock Island is <laughs> quick to forget it, uh, but that is a great rivalry. So we'll see if Rock Island can get revenge this year and bounce back in that epic rivalry game. Well, it, look, it looks like two in the Western Big Six, as they do every year. You know, they they usually start off with two non-conference games before they finish out the season with the rest of the conference. Uh, and I saw that uh, UT Week One plays LaSalle Peru, um, which I, I think they play quite a bit in other sports. Um, so that, that I just happened to notice that it says TBA on their Week Two opponent. I don't know if they filled that or not. I noticed um, that one too. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't know what the status um, of that is. I may have to reach out to. Head coach Nick Welch and see if he has an answer on that one. Yeah. And I, I think if I remember in last year too, I could be completely wrong. Geneseo plays two teams out of the Chicago area 
Uh, they play Chicago Noble, which sounds familiar that they played them last year, and then Grays Lake. And I think Geneseo started 2-0 last year. So, you know, hopefully they can ride that same kind of momentum as they get into conference play. This conference is, is going to be open, and all these games every week are going to determine, you know, kind of your pecking order as you move all the way to, to week nine. I'm excited for the season to get started. I think you guys are excited for the season to get started. Kyle, uh, you going to come around and be my, uh, you know, NUIC go-to for our uh, preview of the 11-man NUIC and also some eight-man talk? Absolutely. You know that. All right. Good deal. Mitch, you're on the hook for the Three Rivers for sure. Yep. I'll usually keep you on the hook for the Lincoln Trail. Yep. And then maybe maybe I'll call in, uh, you know, the guys from WQAD. Matt Randazzo, Corey Cuffler, they can do uh, they can do the Western Big Six preview with me. So, yep. All right. Well, there is plenty of football to talk about in the weeks ahead. We're like what seven weeks away now, six weeks away from high school football. It's a month and a half. It's the first games, uh, August twenty sixth. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Listen in next week. Like I said earlier in the show, we have a great interview with Katie Hassan, the president of the IHSA Board of Directors. She has a lot of great things to talk about um, just in terms of what's going on at the IHSA level when it comes to football. But Kyle, Mitch, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next week. That'll do it for this week's episode of View from the West. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to go out to Apple Podcasts or Podbean and subscribe so you can follow along and downloads will come automatically every week. You can follow along on Twitter at ViewFromWestPod. You can also email me if you're interested in being a sponsor, ViewFromWestPod at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.